Hello there. Welcome to Fireside with Peter Adkison on Gen Con TV. Um, on this show, we go in search of the untold stories behind your favorite games. And we are currently on a deep delve into Dungeons and Dragons. And today, <clears throat> our special guests are Bob Salvatore, Mary Kirchhoff. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I, I don't know. How do you get con crud at a virtual convention? I'm not quite sure, but um, <clears throat> maybe it's just too much talking. <clears throat> so uh, Bob Salvatore is famous in D&D land and way outside of D&D land as well. Um, his lore uh, for his novels set in Forgotten Realms uh, featuring the dark or uh, dark orc. Is that, that's not a dark orc, is that right? Sorry, dark, Bob. Yeah. Dark elf. Uh, <laughs> uh, Drist Warden is also written for Star Wars. He's written for video games, and he is very best known for the Demon Wars saga. Um, also joining us today is Mary Kirchhoff, a novelist herself, uh, formerly vice president of marketing, publishing, and tabletop games at Wizards of the Coast. And um, pertinent for today's uh, topic, has served as Bob Salvatore's editor. So, I, I I like this idea of author and editor together on the show at once. So, um, Mary, Bob, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Right. Exciting. Exciting to be part of Gen Con. I haven't been for a little while. Thanks for inviting me. <clears throat> You're very welcome. And um, yeah, it's uh, uh, an unusual uh, Gen Con <clears throat> this year. <clears throat> Boy, I better start asking ask a question real quick here. My uh, <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, uh, so what we like to do, uh, Bob, is um, start with finding out a little bit uh, about Bob Salvatore before Dungeons and Dragons, before TSR. Like, um, where were you? I mean, I know you're raised in, in in the Northeast, so that's a spoiler alert. But um, tell us <laughs> tell us a little bit about your uh, early your childhood and getting into uh, into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Well, I was born in Central Mass. I still live there. And uh, youngest of seven, five older sisters. That's where the drow came from. Um, <laughs> I was very shy growing up. I, I spent a lot of time skipping school and reading when I was very little. Then school beat the reading out of me. And a Christmas gift when I started college as a math, physics, computer science guy. Oh, my God. Uh, I was undeclared, but I was, yeah, I was, I was thinking I was going to go math or, or science. And um, but for Christmas that year, my sister gave me a copy. My sister Susan gave me a copy of The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. And I threw them aside of the room. I didn't I was upset with that Christmas gift because I needed money. <laughs> my car was breaking down every day. And I, I didn't even think about it until about a, two months later. We had this great blizzard of 78 out here in Massachusetts and everything was shut down. No, no roads, nothing. for Two weeks. Wow. So I was trapped in my mother's house. I woke up one morning, bored out of my mind, and I put on Fleetwood Mac's Rumors album, and the chain was playing, and I opened the book and read Peter Beagle's introduction, and then I read In a Hole in the Ground, They Lived the Hobbit. And all of a sudden, I remembered how much I used to love reading before school beat it out of me, and how much I used to love writing before school beat that out of me. And so I just, I switched my major to communications media, so that I was taking all kinds of lit courses as electives. And I started reading and I read every fantasy book I could get my hands on for the next couple of years, but there weren't that many that you could find. There was no internet. Um, I had Terry Brooks and Stephen Donaldson and Ian McCaffrey and of course Tolkien and Fritz Leiber and then uh, Michael Moorcock later on, but that was about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, you, those were the. Those I couldn't were order the, them online, so it was what my store had, right? That Those were the orthodoxy, right? Right there. That was. Yeah, exactly. And then when I ran out of books to read, I wrote one. And I wrote it. I was working in a plastics factory all day, and I was working as a bouncer at night in the local nightclubs. And when I came home from work, I was too amped up to go to sleep. I put the candles on. I put on a, an album, usually Tusk. I'm a Fleetwood Mac guy, in case you can't tell. And I, and I just started writing in a ring binder. And I just started telling the story. And it's also around the time I found Dungeons & Dragons, uh, 1980, 81. And that would be my weekly. And then it became like two times a week game. So 1980 must have been, um, well, college age for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. I, I graduated in 81. Right. And, and, you know, then I was just having a pretty normal life. And I had finished a book and I sent it out and I got some terrible rejection letters uh, in like 83. <laughs> but that got me mad. So I kept writing. Meanwhile, um, got married. Kids came along pretty quickly. And I had to, you know, I had to help support the family. So I got a job working payroll and then finance at a 
at a high tech company about 20 miles from home. And I remember it was like January, 1987 when I thought, okay, it, this book, the book I had kept been working on since that uh, notebook. I said, I think this is, this is about ready. This is about as good as I'm going to yeah. get it. So I said, I went, got my writer's market and I, I started um, looking at <laughs> all the places that would take unsolicited manuscripts. And one of them was TSR. And okay. I knew them from Dragonlance and D&D. So I sent it in. Right. Okay. So I want to, I want to cover a couple of things before we get into the, um, the <clears throat> TSR, D&D. I mean, the relationship with TSR as a publisher. Uh, so let, you, you said you were playing D&D. Like, how old were you when you started playing D&D? I was in college. My brother, my brother worked at the company I would eventually get a job at, Genrad. And he had a couple of friends at work. He had a friend at work who had another friend who were playing D and D. They were Boy Scout leaders, and they were playing D and D with the scouts. My brother got into it, and then he got me into it. So it was probably around, I think it was nineteen eighty. It might have been early eighty one. Right. And um, yeah, and, and then I was sick. Yourself. I didn't make the first game. So while I was sick, I decided I would write a dungeon, and I yeah. based it on Dante's Inferno. And so the first time I played, I was the DM. Oh my gosh! See, now, you know. I, it was the same for me, by the way. I had the blue box set and uh, opened it up. And I, I was a war gamer before that. I, you know, I grew up playing Avalon Hill, SPI, board war games, hexes and chits, you know. Yep. And um, uh, so I, when I got Dungeons and Dragons, um, I, I couldn't wrap my head around. Like it didn't do a good job really of explaining the idea of a dungeon master and, and players and, and how I, I kept trying to figure out how the turn sequence was and all this sort of stuff, you know, and, and uh, to an Apple on Hill game. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so I was, uh, I, I was doing the, um, uh, I was GMing for the first time. I GMed a, kind of a campaign for like uh, up characters up to like fifth level before. And I still didn't really understand it. It was just like yeah. uh, trying to, trying to make it be like a board game, you know, <laughs> um, and, 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 following very seriously all the plot points of the dungeon right and and then the first time i actually played D, within two minutes i got it because the dm just starts with this thing okay you're all sitting in a bar and this guy <laughs> old man comes in off the uh, from the mountains some old hit guy climbs up on a table and says we're having a lot of troubles with orcs you know and, and <laughs> up, in the, up in the hills and the, the nobility will do anything about it you know what what, what are we gonna do you know and then dm looks at us and says, what do you do like what what i mean we we're just supposed to talk to this guy like what <laughs> <laughs> I love how your engineer's brain was trying to make sense of it all, trying to make it fix and t fit into a box. Yeah. Yeah. Literally fit into a box. So, so how did that campaign go, Bob? I mean, did you, did you run it or oh, just it was kind great of? because this was bad. We were all kind of new to it. So yeah. like when, when they were first level characters and a mummy showed up, yeah, they, they knew they were supposed to be afraid. Unlike the players today who say, hey, he's not going to kill us. And they attack the mummy and you kill them. And then they're all mad at you. So they were they were running more as much as they were fighting, and the, the game was just so fresh at that time for everybody because it wasn't. We were all war gamers. Like I played uh, War and Peace was my game all through. Wow. Late, I don't know when it came out, but from the time it came out all the way into the '90s, War and Peace was a big game we would play. But um, no, it went really well, and for me, it was what I fell in love with was this was two years after I had read Tolkien, two to three years after right. I read Tolkien books. And was reading all the fantasy books and had this itch to start writing. And it's, it really served that purpose for me, whether I was playing or DMing, to right. be creative. It was a great creative outlet. Now, did you, um, <clears throat> uh, the game that you missed, did you catch it into it the, the next session? Did you start playing as well? Right. Oh, yeah. So you were doing kind of a DMing one group and playing the other, or was it all the same group? Or? It was the same group. We, yeah. um, I, we, we were kind of running mini campaigns. People were usually getting wiped out and somebody else would take over. <laughs> <laughs> you remember any of your characters from those days? Any, oh, yeah. Any, my, fir my first character was a barbarian named Balexis. Balexis? He's actually my Warcraft char character now, and he's in the um, Echoes books. He's in, in the, the first book I wrote. He yeah, was sure. the character I pulled from that book. Right. Yeah. Right. right. That's, uh, that's great. Are you still friends with uh, some of the people you played with? Well, my brother's gone, unfortunately, and I haven't seen his friends in a long time. And uh, some of the guys who came in 
like right after the the Boy Scouts basically from that troop stayed with the group for decades, but they're all they're all out of the picture now. Uh, most of my group now are either guys I met in the late '80s who joined the group, or my brother's son plays and my son plays, and a couple of guys I met at um, when I was working with Thirty Eight Studios. Yeah, joined I- in. I love it when the kids start playing, you know, yeah. like, like you have a gaming group and, and then, uh, you know, and they have kids. And then I see a lot, you know, a lot of people kind of get out of it for a while when the, the responsibility of family and kids. And then at some point the kids are old enough to play and it's like, Oh, Hey, I yeah. know what we'll do. I don't know how we'll entertain these youngsters. And, uh, now it's the grandkids. My oldest grandson's starting to play. <laughs> Shut up. <clears throat> You he's shut 10. up right now. He's ten. And he's playing. Yeah. No, really. In fact, uh, we're gonna we're gonna start a game when everything calms down with the new baby that's coming. How did you game. get so old? What happened? We <laughs> happened. It's, it's we been we an happened. incredible journey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, okay. So let's go back to this uh, first manuscript um, that uh, you sent to TSR. Tell us tell us about that and how that process worked out. Oh, I. I went to the writer's market and it told me how to, how to send it. And so I put it together and I sent it in and this was in January. And then I forgot about it because I had a full-time job. I was working in finance and I was very busy and it was, you know, it was an hour from home. I had a three-year-old and a two-year-old at home. And I remember I came home from work one day and my wife uh, said, Hey, uh, someone from TSR called. And it really kind of blew my mind. I'm like, wait a minute, somebody called. Usually you just get these letters that say, you know, dear Leonard, screw <laughs> off, you suck, go die, do something else. <laughs> and she said, yeah, Mary Kirchhoff from TSR called. And so I said, she asked for Leonard. <laughs> no, 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 no. And she left a message and, she, you know, she, she gave me her number and she wants you to call her back. And it was, I could still do it because I knew the time difference was there. So I, Got on the phone and I remember Diane said, take the dog out. He has to go out. And she said, I said, he can wait. And I, and I called. <laughs> and while we were on the phone, the dog peed on my foot. <laughs> oh, my God. Puddles and he earned it. I and remember that. It. it paid but, off. Yeah, but it was great because um, that first conversation, Mary had pulled that book out of the slush pile. And she said, you know, I like what you're doing here. Can you adapt it to the Forgotten Realms? Remember that, Mary? I do. And, I do. And I said, I what actually- are the Forgotten Realms? Yeah, okay. I, I actually, I actually do remember reading your draft. I remember where I was. I was, uh, uh, we were both expecting kids. Yep. I was thinking this uh, return to TSR, but that was my second incarnation there, and uh, having come into the book division, and I was tasked to find the next Weiss and Hickman because we, we didn't want all of our eggs in one basket. And uh, we had, uh, the, I came back after Doug's uh, book, uh, Moonshock, uh, Moonwalker Dark on, Dark Walker Dark Walker on, Moonshade. on Moonshade. Great book. Sorry, it's early here. Great book. Uh, Doug was the one blazing the novel trail for Forgotten Realms. And I, and I came in at that point and was tasked to find the Weiss and Hickman for Forgotten Realms. And uh, I was handed and come back, wasn't really sure how long I would be at the company, but it was a great maternity project and was handed this huge slush pile. And I remember sitting in my house in East Troy, Wisconsin, kind of making my way through the slush pile, not finding anything and reading this manuscript. And I think I said to Steve Winter, uh, another TSR uh, person, favorite person of mine, uh, I think I found a really good writer. Uh, Who would expect that? She never told me this story. This is great. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know that I told anybody because it just happened in our house. And I came back in and I said to uh, Jean Black, who was my boss at the time, who had uh, opened the door for full scale novels at TSR from the Pick a Path books that they had been known for, uh, opened the door for the Dragonlance books that Margaret and Tracy uh, have uh, gone on to great fame for having produced. I said, I think I got a guy. I, 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 we don't want this book, but there's something, there's something, because it's not Forgotten Realms. No, right, right, no, right, right, right. It's not in our world. 
<laughs> right, right. It's not in our world. There's nothing wrong with the book, but it's right. not in our world. Oh, no, there's uh, plenty wrong with the book. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that's not necessarily for me to say. Uh, uh, and, and to be honest, I don't really remember. But I, I, there was just something about your language and something about your facility with characters. And I said, this could work. Yeah, so I, you know that you know. By the way, thanks, Mary, for anticipating my question. I, I uh, you jumped in right as I was about to say. All right, let, let's tell this story from Mary's point of view. Um, uh, but uh, that's a segue to another question I wanted to uh, to get to. W what did you see in that? You said facility with character. Can you expand on on this a bit? Well, Bob actually just reminded me. We've talked uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks, just in general, and. Uh, Bob reminded me that in that first, in his first draft of the book, that actually his first draft. So I, I'm going to rewind a little bit. Had that conversation, Bob. We want to hire you. Here's the good news: we want to publish your book, not this book, but a book you're going to write <laughs> in two months because yeah. uh, we've got to get it in the catalog so the sales guys can sell it in six to eight months in a, advance. It, it was it was two and a half months. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I was I was rounding. Uh, <laughs> I was rounding. The good news is you got a book. The other news is you got to write it at warp speed. And I got to give Bob big credit because whatever was happening behind the scenes, which is apparently his dog peeing on him, he did not flinch. He said something like, I can do that. Good answer. Good answer yeah. for an unpublished author. Yeah, you want to know what's happening behind the scenes? Your yeah, dog was a, being I had on a you. Three year old, a two year old, and my wife was six and a half months pregnant, seven months pregnant. <clears throat> and I had to get a new car because you couldn't put three car seats in a Mustang GT. <laughs> and I had to get a new apartment because our apartment was too small. And I was working a full time job an hour from home. Wow. And so I said, no problem. <laughs> and I'll figure it out later. And he, and, and he I, did. And he did. Okay. So, so, so what, uh, so what book was that? that Crystal was, Shire. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. So, but it changed pretty dramatically after the first draft, because we both realized after that first draft, I might not have been clear about what he was supposed to be doing here. He's not writing a sequel to uh, Dark Walker on. No, that wasn't the first draft. That was the, that was the sample chapter in the outline. Okay. All right. And we had that big, arg not argument, but explanation, because the only thing they sent me in the realms <laughs> was Dark Walker on Moonshe. And if right. you look at the first edition of Dark Walker on Moonshe, what's the map? It's a couple of little islands. That's all it is. <laughs> and Mary says, no, no, no. We don't want you to write a sequel to Doug's book. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? You know, his characters dominate this landscape. Am I going back in time? You know, how are we going to do this? She goes, no, no, we don't want you in the Moonshe. I was like, you want me to write a book in the water? I mean... <laughs> And then she sent me Ed's original maps. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a big world. Find your corner. So how did that get into the world, uh, into the Underdark, into the world of the Drow and, uh, and Dritz? That came later. That came after the... At, I remember I was writing the um, Halfling's Gem, the third book in the Icewind Dale trilogy. Mm -hmm. And I was planning the fourth book to be the retaking of Mithril Hall because they were on their way back to take back Mithra Hall, coming back from Callumport. And Mary told me, Mary and Eric told me, um, no, 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 you know, we're going to tie this up. We're going to want something else. We're going to do more. It'll be with different characters. You know, this is enough. Tie it up. So I tied that book up. And then before, by the time it came out, I was still working full time. By the time it came out, they were like, you know, we're getting a lot of letters about this guy and they want you to, we want you to tell where he came from. And, and that's how Menzo Berenzine came about because um, so I remember I had, I had like the, the, there was an entry on the dark elves on the drow in um, Unearthed Arcana. There was right. like a page in the fiend folio and there were the old modules, right? Descent to yeah. the depths of the earth, vault of the drow, queen of the demon web pits. Right. And that's all I had. So I remember calling and I, Mary, you, know, what, you got anything else? What else are you sending me? She said, that's all there is. Right. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? She, she said, you got carte blanche to create the drow in the, in the realms. And I pulled out Mario Puzo's The Godfather and based it on the five families. Right. That's where that came from. Yeah. That gonna, was like 1989. I'm, I'm going to back up, though, because. Yeah, yeah let's back uh, up. I didn't, I didn't mean Drift. to send, send this. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm backing up Bob there. Back, back up, dude. Back up. You actually introduced 
dritzed way before that and he eclipsed who was intended to be your main character oh absolutely uh, uh, totally equips eclipsed wolfgar and i remember that conversation yeah he's saying i know this is supposed to be your main character but this guy way more interesting uh i felt that when i started writing it too when i started writing it you remember the conversation when dritz was created right no, but you're going to remind you me. Oh, I'm going to remind you. This one, I, this is like, in, I was at work and I had done the, the, the sample chapter that I had given you was Wolfgar and Dareth with Campus the Morhound, Doug Niles' characters attacking Big Grin's lair. And I remember this like it was yesterday and we were on the phone and you were like, uh, okay, I have to go to a sales meeting and I got to sell it to the sales force. And this is a really important meeting to get a book out there. So but I can't use Dareth because, you know, you're thousands of miles away. I said, good, I don't want to use Doug's characters. And you said, but I need a sidekick for Wolfgang for this, for this uh, meeting. And I said, all right, I'll get back to you next week. And you said, no, no, I got to go to a meeting <laughs> and I need a sidekick for Wolfgang. And, and I looked at the time, it was almost lunch. And I said, all right, I won't take lunch. I'll come up with a sidekick and I'll call you back. And I, and you said, no, you don't understand. I'm standing across the hall and I'm late for a meeting and I need a sidekick for Wolfgang. And <laughs> off the top of my head, I said a drow. And you came back and said a black elf, because that's what they were called back then. Or a dark elf, or whatever, both. But it was, um, and I said, and I started thinking, I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, that'll work. No one's done that before. And, and I said, draw a ranger. No one's done that. And you said, um, there's probably a reason. And I said, yeah. And I, but I kept trying to sell it. And you were late for your meeting. And finally you said, okay, since it's just a sidekick, I'll let you get away with it. What's his name? And I remember this because off the top of my head, and I'd never played it in a game. I'd never seen it before. But off the top of my head, I said, Dritz the Warden of Dermon Shesbanon, on the Ninth House of Men's of Baron's Arm. And you were like, what? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> What's a Menzo Baron's on? It must be a city. I don't know. Can you spell it? Nope. <laughs> and that's how he was born. And then I started writing the book. And Mary, and as Mary was thinking about it, she's like, hey, you know, this might be the guy to focus on. I'm like, yeah, I am. Yeah, I agree. Nice. But don't you know, um, I think for those of us who work in creative fields, uh, oftentimes the pressure of uh, that imagination sometimes works better under a lot of pressure you know um or constraints um you know i remember um you know with uh, magic the gathering richard garfield um always was really happy he always credited some of the creativity of that to the fact that we wanted just a simple card game without a lot of extra pieces something you could play but with a fantasy or science fiction theme and that was the the that was really the whole project Andy? yeah the mandate and um i think the creative mind works best under or can work really well let's say it might be a better way of saying it, under some sort of pressure some set of parameters to uh, otherwise you've just got too many options floating around in there right oh, I, 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 I would agree with that i mean if i had had not had deadlines for novels they would have probably they would still be half-written novels and drawers. Uh, there's something about deadlines and expectations and pick something, you know, which is essentially what a deadline is. Pick something, make a decision and make it right, uh, can inspire pretty amazing things, uh, which is why we're both up really early on a Sunday morning to talk about it 30 years later. <laughs> well, I mean, for me, it's like, there'll always be a point in a book where I'm like, something's missing as I'm nearing the end. And then the fact that that deadline's coming, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll just lie there. My brain will be spinning. And that's how I resolve almost every book that I've ever written. And that's like 60 times. I know the process now. It, it, it's as that deadline nears, your focus becomes sharper and sharper and sharper. Yeah. 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 I, I want to, uh, Bob, when we were talking in the last couple of weeks, you reminded me of something that I think is particularly topical now that I had forgotten which is how uh, in those first drafts, we realized that uh, a, a particular fantasy trope, which was all guys all the time, there was no women 
in your. We didn't realize it. You did, and you beat. The okay, all right. I'm, I'm being a little royal there. <laughs> <laughs> but it was your memory. I did not remember that I said, "Hey, you need some gals in this book." Yeah, and it was funny because uh, I turned in the first draft 15 days after my daughter Caitlin Brielle was born, and that was Caddy Bree. That's where I came up with the name for both of them. It kind of worked back and forth. But uh, yeah, Mary, and I've, I've credited you a hundred times because, and more I, uh, every day, because I think if I had had the basic guy editor at the time, that wouldn't have come up because right. that's the way the genre was. It's not the way the genre became, thank God, but that's the way the genre was. And, you know, it's funny because I look back on that and there was, you know, was I a sexist? Yeah. And so were all my sisters. And so was everybody I knew because we thought that's the way the world was. We thought it was like this mutual agreement and it, it wasn't. And it took a lot of very powerful women to explain to us that it wasn't any mutual agreement that they had ever agreed to. Right. Mary explained that to me and those, and my wife too, in no uncertain terms. <laughs> and, and so for me, it's like the, the new series I have out the coven, the main character is a woman. Alan, and I love this character as much as anything I've ever done. I never would have been able to get to this point where I could have done that. And, and I, I credit Mary with that. And it was, it was, you know, lucky breaks, right? Having forgotten realms over my name in the first book that I put out there to get a bunch of people reading it, getting a Larry Elmore cover for it, which was amazing. And having Mary editing it because she, she's tough as nails and she didn't let me get away with stuff. And I think it, it helped me very early on realize you got to look more than your narrow perspective on life to find things for stories. Right, right. So, uh, so Mary, uh, how did the meeting go after that uh, conversation with Bob or your <laughs> do, do you remember? Uh, <laughs> I... not, not specifically, but the sales meetings were not that different. You know, uh, I, I won't dwell on it for long, but I remember going into sales meetings and it was a new thing for editorial because in that at that time I wasn't in marketing. There was this divide between product and marketing. And when I say or sales, there was no marketing department at TSR, not really at that time. There were sales guys. I mean, typical sales guys, uh, stereotypical sales guys. And uh, I remember spending a lot of time going into the detail of the story and the sales guy's eyes would glaze over. Yeah. So that conversation was really for me. Uh, what I can share with you was I needed to know that in order to go in and sell it with enthusiasm. They didn't care. You know, they were just hearing about another book, but I needed it. I needed right. to be able to really embrace this is going to be something different. We've got something here. We got a ti another tiger by the tail. Uh, right. The first, the first tiger being, well, frankly, the first tiger being Rose Estes's Pick a Path books. I mean, that paved the way for all of us to call ourselves novelists, quite frankly. And then Margaret and Tracy's work with Dragonlance and Doug, you know, who went in after that and and carved out his own amazing career. So, uh, but it was always about story and it was always about character for those of us working the editorial side. I, I think in those early days, the sales guys put up with our emphasis on story, but and, the but the fans knew the difference. Sales guys might not have, but the fans knew the difference, right. and that's what made it. I have, a, it. I have a question. Can I ask Mary a question here? Mary? Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah, I've always assumed something, and I've actually talked about it, and and I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong, but I always thought if I had sent my manuscript in three months earlier, that you weren't looking for a second Forgotten Realms author because Doug was doing the first book and he did the third book, I believe. And when you say Doug, you mean Doug Niles. Doug right? Niles. Just, just for anybody watching. Doug Niles. So, yeah, um, yeah. so yeah. I always figured that had I sent that book in a few months earlier, I would have just gotten a rejection slip. And then I thought if I had sent that book in a few months later, after Doug's book finally went to press and everybody saw how wonderfully it was being received, that I would have had to been competing against, you know, all the other really good creative people up at TSR who at that time were all jockeying for Dragonlance books, right? Cause that was the big. So I always figured that had I sent that book in six months earlier or six months later, that I never would have had the break. I never would have got there. Well, and that, that was my last chance, by the way, that was it. If I, that I, my family was growing too much for me to even think about continuing to focus on any kind, any kind of schedule on writing. If I didn't, if I had, if I didn't make it with that book 
and all I was trying to do was get one book published because I thought if I got one book published, that would be kind of cool. You know, it kind of separate me from just being a number. Yeah. Somewhere. So, so here's the, here's the truth of that. Yes. And, uh, and the end part is, there was probably this perception at that time that there was this whole book department, but there really wasn't. There was a manager who didn't have the time to read the slush pile. And then there was like one or two editors still working on pick a path books at that time. There was not really a novel department at that time. That was kind of what I was brought in to do something about. So I don't know how long that slush pile sat there unattended because nobody had the time to look at it. And maybe that's not as romantic as your version, but the truth is like most businesses, nobody had the time to get to it. And it, and it, and you might be right in that, you know, there was time for the Dragonlance books to settle and there was time for a Forgotten Realms novel to come out. And I don't know if it was me or other people, I wouldn't credit it with me necessarily, but there was this sense that we have to do something with the Forgotten Realms that's different than Dragonlance. From a brand perspective, how do we differentiate it? Dragonlance is all about Margaret and a, a central set of characters. Yeah. And this is essential. This is, I think, an important point from a story perspective and from a business perspective. Dragonlance is about a central group of characters. And anytime I, as a novelist or anybody else, strayed from those central characters, the sales didn't go as well. The organization recognized that and said, uh, back to the you know eggs in one basket, the Forgotten Realms is a way bigger map, a way bigger place than Dragonlance. Maybe that's how we differentiate it. We start to create a world where every author can have his own corner and we see what hits. You know, let's see how Doug does with his Moonshade books and how well his characters resonate with people. Let's not create that central cast of characters. Let's create, and we did exactly that. And some resonated better than others. Some who are on this call resonated better with others. And that created its own internal conflict. Like what kind of monster have we created? Is Bob going <laughs> to ask us for things we can't possibly do as a work for hire place? The, you know, I could, we could go on, you know, the conversation could go on about that too. And that, that's what differentiated us as well too, uh, I would say, because we wanted to be in integrity with the people who created the works, even though they were work for hire. We wanted to create, and this ties back into what Jim Lauder and I were talking about a month or so ago when Jim and I were on. It was really our goal to bring out the best writing that we could and let the fans sort of tell us what was working or what was resonating with them and yeah. trying to yeah. honor. And that's how by book three, we recognized this Bob guy, this RA guy that we made him call himself. And by we, I mean me, uh, you know, uh, he's so you, different. You, you, you started that? You, you started the RA? So what, what, uh, I, I have you... a feeling, I have a feeling Bob would credit me with that. But we did have that conversation. He'll remember better than I did. But we did discuss, should I be Bob? But everybody calls me Bobby. I said, nobody calls you Bob. Nobody says Bobby off, outside of the East Coast. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I literally. Go, that. Yeah. And I, I said, well, I'll go with the initials because it was, um, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien got me into it. And then the other, the other part of that was if you, if you look at what TSR was doing at the time, it was Doug and Tracy and Margaret and Troy. And, you know, it was all like kind of. And so I thought maybe if I use IRA, someone will remember me because it will <laughs> stand out from all the other ones that they had at the time that were. Well, and Salvatore is such a great name too. I mean, that's a that's that's a that's a, a blessing there, right? Hey, so hey, Mary, you brought up work for hire. You know, uh, I I think there might be people that watch and not quite sure what that means. Like, well, it it why sets it, why yeah, is it, it right? What 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 is it? I, you know, I recently heard another term for it. I think it was Gene Raby who. What is what was Gene's recent award for? It was effectively shared world. Uh, work for hire is a legal term contractually that says, you know, the publisher owns the rights to it. But practically speaking, it means a shared world where multiple authors write in one environment, but they don't, they don't keep the rights to it. The brand holder, like Forgotten Realms or Dragonlance, holds the brand yeah. and retains the rights to it. That's what it means. But what we tried to do is invest people with the ability to develop their own story 
while maintaining the brand's integrity. And that's where it ties into the whole game novel, which is leading right. the story. Uh, is the game leading the story or is the are the novels leading the story, which is, you know, years of my work life. Right, right. It was yep. that conflict that broke me up with TSR in the mid 90s in a very bad way. By the way. Right. Well, uh, yeah, I don't think we want to get quite to that yet, but I think we certainly <laughs> want to get to it. Uh, but in 1987, were Bob, were you sensitive to issues of um, work for hire? Did you, or you just wanted to get something published, you know? I actually had, um, I got an agent very soon after I had sent the book in and he told me not to do it. He told me to not, to not accept the, uh, the offer because I wouldn't want to ever get in that environment. I won't make a lot of money. And I'm like, so you're not going to sell this book anywhere else. And how much money am I going to make then? It's not about the money. I wanted my name on a book. And so that's when I lost my agent very soon after that. And I was glad because he didn't, he never got it. Right. And I have to say that, that at that point in time, if it had been a Dragonlance novel where I was using someone else's characters, which I hate to do, I still would have done it because I wanted to be a published author. That was the main thing. Sure. And the way they did the realms just made it so much better for me because I mean, one of our biggest conversations was where to set the story so that I would be away from everybody else. You know, we spent hours on the phone trying to figure out exactly where on this gigantic map I would best fit for my stories that wasn't going to bump heads with the modules that Doug was doing in the Bloodstone Lands or whatever he was doing there or Moonshays or Ed's work in Cormier or whoever right. was working in Calimport. And also, the after a while, after I started writing, it became very, very important to me to let the character, the, the, uh, the thing that Mary was spearheading up there was these are your characters. So if I wanted to use like Elminster in a book, it could be like a cameo maybe. And Ed would have to get a chance to take a look at that. We were being really respectful of each other's work, which right. drew, I, I, I don't think I thought of that initially, but as I became an author, as I started writing books and these characters, I started realizing the impact the characters had on me. Right. The idea that somebody else could take them and run with them was like driving me insane. I, it, I, I, I don't think I would handle that well. In fact, I didn't handle that well. Well, let, uh, let's go to that then. So, uh, yeah, what happened? Um, uh, what happened there uh, when um, <laughs> things came to a head later on? With uh... well, it, it was it was really a, a series of miscommunications, and I'll take part of the blame on myself. But um, a new editor up there, Mary, had retired for. For a while, anyway, she had gone into a long sabbatical, and the new editor up there, somebody I had just signed some books with in New York, actually at, at Warner, and I act recommended for it. Uh, was one of the people who said, "Yeah, I'm working with them, and it's been good so far," and it was. But when he got up there, it was it was a few things. First, they did a book called Once Around the Realms, and he wrote it, and that book was nothing more than than a dog peeing on the trees around the yard to let people know it was their yard. And that's what TSR was doing. I felt like that's what TSR was doing to all of the authors. They were letting them know whose properties this really were. You know, these properties belong to them, not us. And, and that's the only reason they did that book. I'm still convinced that's the only reason they did that book. And the so way, that, the, the way he did this, uh, you know, you're peeing on the yard analogy was by using all these other characters. All the other characters, like yeah. Dritz was in the book. Right. And I had no say in it. And so that mutual respect we were talking about a moment ago was out the window. It was, we were being put in our place. Right. And then when the hardcovers started coming out right away, when the new editor took over and the legacy was supposed to do, you know, all right. And it just blew up, made the times, sold. 10 times the copies we planned, we had thought it was going to sell. And the other books were going great. So as I was finishing that series, it was time for a new contract. And I remember I went back and I said, look, I'll do the same terms as the last contract. I think I asked for a little bump on the original books in royalty rate, maybe 
because they were nowhere near New York rates. And, I, and we were selling New York numbers and then some. And I was just trying to get a little bit of a bump, which they gave me. They, they agreed to. But, and, I, and, I would, um, and then I would just do the contracts for the new books because I wasn't really worried about big advance because the books, you were getting paid very quickly. Unlike New York, they weren't holding a 50% reserve, reserve and paying you six years after the book comes out or whatever. They were paying quarterly and they were paying on ship and they were holding a minor reserve. They were really treating the authors very, very, very well compared to the traditional publishing model. Right. So I said, let's just do the same thing. Let's just extend the three books. I was still, you know, things were going well. I'll put yeah. it that way. So I just wanted to keep them going. And really what broke us up, in addition to the bad feelings you could see starting to grow in the background um, about, you know, them making clear who's, who's going to write the stories is up to them with the characters, whether you created them or not, was... They said, we want you, oh, you also have to give us some more paperbacks to replace the cleric quintet. And I said, well, you know, look, I've written a lot of books in a very short time and I'm pretty much out of, I'm out of gas here. And I've got to do the three books that you had signed me for with the other publisher. And now three more books with this. That's two books a year for three more years. I can't add, you know, three more books to that right now. Right. And the answer was, no, you got to do it. There's, there's, we need those paperbacks. They're integral to our book line. And I'm thinking, this is crap because the paperbacks of the books I'm writing in hardcover were all making the New York Times. This is, I, I, so it was more of a, it was more of a, I'm going to get you under my thumb type of thing. Right. And, 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 and it, it just, the feelings got really bitter on both sides as it went on. And, and this the, then, they, then came the threat. If you're not going to sign this contract, I'm going to get someone else to write tricks. And I said, well, you know what? Uh, actually, on a Friday night, I, I, I found a cave. And I said, okay, I'm going to, all right, whatever, whatever, I'll sign. Because I was scared. We had bought a new home. I had three little kids. This was my livelihood. And I wasn't rich or anything like that. I needed money. I needed this. I had quit my job. Right. I, I wasn't going to be able to get back in the workforce very easily. And I went through that. I didn't sleep all weekend. And my wife looked at me and said, look, if we go back to living the way we were before, we'll go back to living the way we were before. We'll make it work. You can't do this. This is going to kill you. And it, and it, and it was true. So I called him back on Monday and I said, no, I'm not doing it. I can't do it. And he said, I'm going to get someone else to write drifts. And I said, well, here's the one thing I am going to tell you. If anybody else writes a novel that features drifts, and you know this story, Peter, because this was our first conversation after you bought the company. He said, if anybody else is writing a novel with Dritz, I'm never writing that character again. I just want you to know that's no longer my character. I right. put up with the short story or the, the Once Around the Realms, and I put up with, they did a short story that somebody else did that I had no input into and didn't want to hear it. And they did some other work, the double diamond stuff or whatever. And they used my other characters without asking me and, or talking to me. I just felt it was incredibly disrespectful that, that the company would do that without even letting the author know, but that's where it, they were. It was really short. It was really short sighted. And this was around 1995. Is that right? So I think it was like 94, maybe 94. Okay. Mary, when did you leave? Uh, which time? <laughs> I've come and gone so many times. I probably left around 93 or 94. So it was, it was probably happened in 94 when the legacy 95. came out. This happened yeah. a couple of years later. So it was probably 94 or 95 in the fall right. of 94, early 95. And I just said, that's it, I'm out. Um, so because I were... just couldn't do it. It, it. The integrity of the work I felt was being threatened. Yeah. You know, if they were going to hold that over my head, then then I saw no reason to continue. And I didn't have any other contracts, right? I wasn't even talking to any of the pub. I had, I had some other books I had to finish, the ones I had signed with him in New York, but that was it. And they, you know, that, I wasn't going to make a living on it, but I, I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. Right. I, right. First of all, I can't write three books a year. Right. And second of all, I think at one point in the conversation was the, well, you just, you know, you just give us the idea for it. We'll get someone else to write it. We'll put your name on it. And I, <laughs> and I'm like, go away. That's not, that's not what this business means to me. This is, yeah. it's, if it's not personal, I don't want to be doing this. It's too painful if it's not personal. And that was it. And it was, it got really ugly. That's such a good lesson in um, the relationship that authors have with their characters. Uh, you could talk about that relationship uh, in another way, but here's the, here's what it means. What it means is like, 
you, you you can't just be ripping these characters away from an author like that. No, and the, and and what what how that really manifests in, is in fan connection. Fans know the difference. They know they know a, an arranged marriage. It was a phrase I used to say. The fans, no matter even if we had thought to do it, the fans recognize an arranged marriage. If it is not that genuine connection with the characters. Right. Uh, from, from the author's perspective, the fans know it. doesn't Doesn't matter what the initial sales numbers are. That's what I mean by short sighted. Right. It was good business. It is good business. It's right. smart business. In addition to just being the right thing to do, to let authors uh, manage their characters, even in a shared world or a work for hire setting, it's just smart. Right. Right. And you know, let me jump in here a little bit because. I understand that they do that. I mean, Dragonlance has stayed successful for a long, long time, sharing some characters, right? Star Wars, Star Trek. But that's different. That's, that, that was, of course, those are a little different because you all know who the characters are because of who the actors showed you they were. Right. It's very different when you don't have that multimedia, you know, interpretation in front of you. Right. And and again, I I think I would have been okay with it because I, look, I've used I, I used I had to use um, Tim Zahn's Mara Jade when. Hold on a second. Do we have a baby? Update. It, baby was born at nine thirty. Sixth grandson good. born at nine thirty. Riley is here. <laughs> wow. See that breaking news. Put the breaking, breaking news, news banner up, Marcus. Come on, put it up. <laughs> you heard it here first on Fireside with Peter Atkinson. Bob Salvador has a new uh, descendant. <laughs> yes, he's a, yes. He's a new gaming member, is what he has. Well, member, I have a yeah. good group now, man. Uh, but anyway, it was more the it was more the attitude that was being shown. I mean, the fact that you would have somebody else, you would write a book and put my character in it, or you would write have somebody else write a short story, and you wouldn't even talk to me. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. when Elaine Cunningham did Starlight and Shadows, right? Uh, she used some of my characters. And I was thrilled because Elaine would get on the phone with me and say, what do you have? What are you thinking of doing with Gromp? Because I, I, first of all, I was thrilled that somebody else was going to jump into the drow as well, because right. I thought that was just too big a world for me to do by myself. And right, right. so many stories to tell, but she would, Elaine was calling me and she was saying, you know, what, what are you going to do? With, what do you have planned for Gromp? Because here's what I want to do. And I, and I would just listen to her and I'm like, yeah, do that. And that's what made the realm so wonderful. I remember when I, in the second book, I was going through this little town called Long Saddle. And Long Saddle, all it said, it was like a paragraph in the gray box set that said it was run by the Harple, the eccentric wizard family, the Harples in the, living in the Ivy Mansion up on a hill. <laughs> and so I, I called Ed Greenwood and I said, Ed, <coughs> I'm going to run with this. And, and I'm going to get back to you. So I finished the whole thing with the invisible wall. And they had to go out and wipe the birds off it every day. And, and the one that turned himself into stone, thinking he could turn himself back and not realize that once you're stone, you can't cast the spell because you're stone. And so he's still stone. And, and all these other things that were going, all these crazy things, the bridge you walk under instead of over, all those crazy things. And Ed and I were on the phone. And we were both laughing like little kids because it was so much fun. That yeah. kind of collaboration to me is, is what makes the world sing if you're doing shared world. But this was different. The feeling right. here was you're going to do what we tell you to do or we're going to do this to you. Yeah. And I don't take threats like that very kindly or lightly. And, and I just said I'm out. And I didn't have any contracts Good. and Good. we were getting ready. We we're going to sell a house if we had right. to. Okay, so uh, we only have 10 minutes left. I want to spend... Let, we gotta we gotta reconcile you know we gotta put the button on this story the happy reunion um <laughs> we gotta do that story and then give you a few minutes to talk about uh you know what you know promote whatever you'd like to promote what you're doing these days so so uh of course i i remember my part of the story but the, this is like but so what what's how do you tell the story of how you got back into um working on the uh d d fiction well, for me, I remember when you called, the first call we had was you called me and said you needed me to settle the lawsuit so you could send me the check. Because <laughs> when when TSR went bankrupt, I had a book come out, hit the New York Times right around that time. They owed me a lot of money. And so I filed a lawsuit to become a secured creditor because I didn't want my books winding up with somebody else who didn't 
have to honor even the contracts that I had. Right. And I remember it took me like a month to get my lawyers to finally drop the lawsuit. They wanted more money um, from me, not from you. But um, and, and so I was eternally grateful because you walked right in and you did a lot of things with that company that respected the artists, respected the writers, respected the designers. And I remember that and I'm forever grateful to you. Oh, well, thank you. I, I'm, um, for, I'm forever grateful that you came back to the fold, you know. <laughs> well, if you remember our first conversation, I said, thanks, but no thanks. But yeah. it wasn't like that. It was just that you want me back to write dreads. Your editor doesn't like me and I don't like him. Yeah. We're never going to trust each other. Right. So it would have, I would have to be working with someone else. Right. And, and also... I'm not coming back to write Dritz, but I will consider coming back to write something else. Now, I had already signed another deal. I was working with Del Rey at the time, and it was exclusive, but I, but I figured they would let me do this. I said, I won't come back and do Dritz if, if Del Rey lets me, it, because you have another writer writing Dritz, and I'm holding to that. I said, if somebody else writes Dritz as a, as a, in a novel, then I'm done. It's not my character right. anymore, and I don't want to even look at him again. Right. And... You came back and said, you know, he's the head editor. I can't do a project this important unless he's involved in it. And I said, fine. You know, I wish you best of luck. Thank you so much. And I sincerely wish you best of luck going forward. I've got Del Rey now. I'm happy. I'm doing my Demon Wars books. And I'm creatively satisfied. And I'm happy. And, and I'm working. So, you know, good luck. Thanks for, thanks for coming in and making everything right. And thanks for saving a company that means a lot to me. And then I remember I was at a convention. And I think it was, in, I think it was in San Francisco at a library convention. And I came back to the hotel room and the light was flashing. I thought it was here at checkout. Is it 9 a.m.? But no, it was you. And you said, Bob, <laughs> big things have changed. Um, we, we hired Mary Kirchhoff back and we want you working in the rooms. And then I got Del Rey to let me, let me do it. Yeah. And then, and you, uh, you I, also had, happened in a fairly short period of time because that, that the the guy we're not mentioning his name. Uh, he wasn't there very long. I mean, we I a month at most from yeah. That. I realized yeah. very quickly. I, you know, I think I think it might have this period might have lasted longer than a month because um, I think we might have had a conversation before the deal was done to acquire TSR. Like there there was a process where yeah, probably. Uh, there was Probably. a due diligence phase where we had a, um, a letter of intent in place, but then you have to finalize contract. That process took about two months. So, um, well, two things on there that. was two I've... things on that, Peter. I want you to clear up for me. Sure. Actually, breaking news. Flash it. Um, first <laughs> of all, I had I don't think I had anything to do, and I felt bad about it, even though I didn't like the guy. But I didn't have anything to do with him getting fired. That was over other things, from what I understand don't go into it but i don't think that was about me and i um, and i and i have no idea why the other author's book got canceled i i expect that probably had to do with getting me back up to, to no small extent um and i don't feel bad about that because somebody was writing a book they knew i didn't want them to write and they had asked a dozen other people to do it yeah. and they all said no because they were trying to maintain the integrity of that but that was my understanding anyway and yeah, no, it, you're you're right. It was you weren't the primary factor, but a factor for sure. I mean, it's um uh the relationships uh that had disintegrated under his tenure were a, a you know a, a, a symptom, you know, uh, a, of a of a bigger problem. And um uh so, you know, you you can't it, it can't blame you for being a symptom of his problem, right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I hate to be that person. Yeah, no, nobody wants to be that person. No, um, uh, there were some, yeah, th it was more about some legal filings within the company. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, uh, it, and so Mary comes back, convinces you to write Dritz, uh, and uh, so. <laughs> the world is a better place. Yeah, uh, well, Mary, well, well, tell me about how you got back. Uh, well, I think I might have mentioned, uh, uh, I have one more conversation with Peter here, uh, and I probably need to do this off screen, but uh, I came back, uh, my, my husband at the time, Steve Winter and I were having a party, first time, I, first time I met Peter, we had a staff party for his departing 
for Steve's departing staff, the ones who were going on to Seattle, we had decided not to go on to Seattle and not leave the Midwest. And Peter was at that backyard party and we chatted about the old days. And I thought, well, that's really lovely. Yay. You know, uh, TSR is in good hands. Peter's a good dude. The end. And I think it might have been like the next day or a day after that, Steve and I are in the backyard with our kids in hip waders cleaning a fish pond, no less. And <laughs> Peter stops by. We look up. Somebody's walking into the backyard. I couldn't find your number, I, but I'd been <laughs> since I'd been there. I just drove over. <laughs> you just drove over because we were on the way to the airport. I didn't, didn't you know, the, the the new TSR owner is in our backyard. I'm looking my best and hip waders with fish guts all over my face. And uh, out of the blue, he says, "Hey, are you interested in coming back?" And uh, I I went, "Well, you know, we're not moving. We've already said no to that offer." And Peter said. I think you can do it from here. Yeah, and I went. Great. Okay, you're going to do it the right way. We're going to go back to Bob. Bob will understand this. I first time I met Mary. I mean, she just blew me away. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I mean, come on, Mary. You, I'm sure you're. You have some awareness of how mm -hmm. wonderful of a person you are, and how powerful of a person you are, and and uh, you know, it it didn't. I think if I um, <clears throat> did one thing right in my career was um is i could recognize people that i wanted to have on my team and um as i and i knew i had this disaster on my hands with that other guy and um and i'm like you know the fiction part of tsr is half the revenue i mean you know dungeons and dragons is the brand but these worlds and these line of fiction is the money and so <clears throat> i knew i had to that have bob somebody. helped make the money you know, yeah, bringing I, it back to the real star of the show here. Yeah. Well, uh, but I appreciate time out, time out, time out. I remember Gen Con, and this was before when all the books were selling fairly similar numbers, where you had like 15 authors there, and we had our own booth there, and we were hanging out, and I and we outsold games, I think, at that Gen Con, and you got in trouble for that. Or yes, got, I did. Yes, you did, because <laughs> you were a game company. Yes. Right. So, no, you know, I, I wasn't kidding at the beginning and I'm not just saying it because we're on the phone call together. But when I said my three lucky breaks, there's a reason that having you as my first editor was one of them. But what Peter just said, mm -hmm. you don't take any crap and you're smart as hell and you're nice enough that I don't hang up, but nasty <laughs> enough that I better listen. And that's a skill. <laughs> I, I really like that description. I think that's the first time I've heard it. Thank you for that. And, and I'll have it recorded. You could come back. And, uh, <laughs> Peter, do you okay. Peter, do you remember how we met? Uh, during headlights, that help me, help me out. <laughs> it was at a convention early on in in Alabama, um, in in Huntsville. I think it was called Camelot, and you were there, and you and Richard were there and you gave my kids i was a guest there you gave my kids the first packets of magic, magic cards, cards the little the little box yeah and i was like well thank you that was so nice and you looked at me and you said don't thank me we own them now <laughs> and i remember that and then thousands of dollars on magic cards later i was like that's son of a <laughs> I, yeah there's a little drug dealer part of me over here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are Love running it. out of time. Bob, I got, I got, uh, please, uh, tell, tell people who are watching, you know, what, what they should look for soon from Bob Salvatore. Well, Relentless just came out that finishes the Generations trilogy. Um, there's a couple of other things stirring, but right now there's really nothing scheduled. Uh, you know, do I do more? I, I do have one more story I'd like to tell with. The dark elves and with Dritz, but I'm not sure at this point where we're going with that. And also, I, I, I'm going to go back to my Demon Wars world at some time, at some point, because the last series I wrote there, the Coven series, is is, is my, one of my favorite things I've ever done, and I really love the way the world came out of that, and I want to I want to explore that a little more. Nice. Um, but that you know, there's nothing really. I took the first four months of this year off on purpose because it was my first vacation in 30 years plus and I was out in California and then we just went I just went to the beach and hung out with my grandkids out there and right. you know and then COVID hit 
Yeah. And yeah. and I don't, you know, I was supposed to be guest of honor at Gen Con this year. Oh, I was I finally know. coming back after six years. And <laughs> and see, I, every time I'm supposed to come back, something bad happens, either in my life or with Gen Con. Well, well here you, know, you are, one of the more important events at Gen Con. You well, know. you know the hero's journey. There are obstacles along the way. And eventually, <laughs> eventually we will get I'm there. a Campbellian story waiting to happen. There you go. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. Um, all right. Well, okay. Well, that wraps up another episode of Fireside with Peter Atkinson. Um, our next show will be in just three days. Uh, this Wednesday, back to our regular time slot of 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, when Mary Kirchhoff will return uh, with our guest, Gene Raby. Uh, so I hope you guys all are enjoying Gen Con Online, by the way. Um, uh yeah, it's uh, we've had a great show. I, I hope you've had a good time. We've uh, we feel like it's gone pretty well. Fingers crossed. So uh, thank you all for uh, participating in that. Um, so uh, thanks once again to our guests, Bob Salvatore and Mary Kirchhoff, our studio manager Marcus Mays, our streaming manager Lauren Bond, our producer Derek Guter, to uh, GenCon TV for hosting us. But most importantly, thank you for watching. <laughs>